Fallout 76 is a pretty interesting or even odd game. Even among those who actually play the game on a regular basis, many haven't actually totally beaten it. A couple of months ago, I made a video looking at the story overall, and I heard from a ton of people that I regularly interacted with in the community how they actually never got to some of those quests. I think this is large in part due to the format of Fallout 76's story. It's told in a passive way. You find out what happened to people that you kind of already know the fate of, and after a while, reading one more terminal just gets a little bit tiresome. Well, in this video, what I'm going to be doing is actually going through some of Fallout 76's lore or interesting story components and sharing with you some of the most fascinating things that happened. Maybe in this video you know one or two of the options, but I imagine most of you won't actually know every single thing, as some of these pieces of lore are fairly obscure just being in one terminal entry, but pretty much all of them have pretty wide impacts and definitely make the game a bit more interesting. As even though I'm not a huge fan of the way Fallout 76's story is told, the story itself is actually pretty cool and I think a lot of people are passing it up wrongly. If you guys enjoy the content or want to see more Fallout 76 lore videos, let me know in the comments. This is something a little bit different, but something I'm curious about doing more of. Either way, the first one hits on a very sore point among many Fallout fans, especially in the Bethesda era of Fallout, and that is on retconning. One of the more recent Fallout 76 DLCs actually added in an interesting or different explanation for a very popular or commonly cited retcon in the Fallout universe that around Jet. So if you're not familiar with how this originated, basically in Fallout 2, Jet was created by Myron, reportedly in 2240. But in Fallout 4, you could actually find Jet in Vault 95, as well as terminals referencing shipments of Jet going to Vault 95 before the Great War even started, and thus well before 2240 when apparently Jet was created. There have been many explanations as to what's actually going on here, such as there being a Jet recipe before the war, then it being lost, then Myron actually rediscovering it, or many things along those lines. But Bethesda actually added a bit more to this with the Burroughs DLC basically added in a new dungeon, and one of those terminals touches on Jet. It's pretty simple and really easy to miss if you don't know the context. One of the Doctor's terminals talks about exotic tastes, and if you're looking for a cutting edge high, some of my more adventurous customers told me they get a real rush from inhaling the fumes of cow droppings, and how he does have some of this cow droppings on hand. So the way this all fits in is, in Fallout 4, the crafting recipe for Jet actually involves Brahmin feces. That is how Jet is made in the Fallout universe. Following the Great War, or at least immediately after it, where this terminal entry is roughly from, people were experimenting with, well, smelling poops. One of them gave them an interesting or notable response, and that was the precursor to what we now have as Jet. This was evidently popular enough for doctors to stock it for people to actually purchase, and over time, it now does make a little bit of sense for people to actually take this and actually develop an inhalation method around it, and thus we get Jet. And I think this is more in support of that theory that maybe there's variants of Jet, or it was more byproduct of natural means. People were smelling poop and getting a reaction. Then they developed various means to enhance that reaction. Myron has one of them, but apparently other people created other ones as we see it in Appalachia. Something else that may have not been super questionable or obvious that you should be questioning it in Fault 76 are caps. Caps are the currency of Fault 76, right? That's normal. Except when you start to think about it, you're like, wait, how would they have used caps already? Much of what you actually see in Fault 76, the remainders of the people that previously lived there all occurred in just the 10 to 20 years following the bombs dropping. How in such a short period of time did people automatically just start switching to using bottle caps? It'd be like if we entered into a real life apocalypse and all of a sudden everyone ditched the paper money for bottle caps, that would just be weird. In other fallouts it makes sense, people are drinking Nuka-Cola over the long haul for survival reasons, and there are several different currencies popping up based on certain regions. What would otherwise seem like a bit of a plot hole or just some kind of inconsistency in Fallout 76 is actually explained. At a terminal within the White Springs Hotel, you can actually find an update to the staff of the White Springs Hotel. Dated October 2077, right before the bombs dropped themselves, it was described how the Nuka-Cola Corporation will sponsor a business class promotion. To celebrate the release of Nuka-Cola Quantum, at the White Springs Hotel, the Nuka-Cola bottle cap will be accepted as legal tender all throughout the hotel. So now it still could be viewed as a bit of a stretch that just an event going on at the White Springs would be generalized to the rest of the area, but at 
the same time, I feel like it is plausible. The White Springs had automated guards all throughout it. It would make sense if following the bombs dropping, a lot of people just kind of flocked to that location, knowing it would be at least fairly safe. And even further, of course, inside of it, you have all these automated robots behind the guards selling very useful items in the apocalypse. Clothes, armor, chems, food, weapons. Even further, we know some of the head government brass did move there, so it does make sense how that could influence the generalized acceptance of the bottle cap in the area. But either way, if you're ever wondering why were bottle caps accepted in Fallout 76, it seems like it all originated from a promotion going on at the White Springs Hotel. Have you ever noticed how in Fallout 76 there are new creatures? I mean, yeah, probably most of you have. Some of these are pretty awesome. Things like the Mega Sloth or even the Honey Beast that really stand out as cool and unique creatures that only appear in Fallout 76. This is another one of those things that Bethesda does go out of their way to explain. Why some creatures are reserved for Fallout 76 and never make it out of Appalachia, and definitely not into some of the later games taking place hundreds of years later. And really, their explanation kind of is just Darwin. In game, for better or worse, this is never explicitly mentioned. At least in my search, I couldn't find a terminal or anything referencing this directly, but that kind of does make sense. It wouldn't really be plausible for some of the people in Appalachia to know why some creatures go extinct, considering they didn't didn't actually go extinct yet? Well, if you guys do remember, all the way back in the Noclip documentary, Bethesda does have one line on this. Closer to when the bombs actually detonated, so there's more radiation, so you can get crazier mutants and giant plants because it's more radiated at that time, you know, it's half-life, it's gonna decrease over time. Right. So that's our justification, like, well, I haven't seen that in future fallouts. Like, maybe that was, like, such a bad mutation that they died out. But here, like, it still exists, and it's like in full swing. And that honestly makes a lot of sense. This is the closest game we have to the bombs dropping in Fallout's world. Radiation levels naturally are going to decay over time, especially when you're looking at a timeline of 100 to 200 years. Plus, I'm sure a lot of these creatures over time simply aren't cut out for survival. Evidently, the Mega Sloths were just a little bit too slow, and they couldn't actually get to their food quick enough. Maybe all the fungi ended up growing too large and taking the rest of them out. Now, in reality, it's pretty likely that this is just a byproduct of Bethesda creating new and unique creatures for this game, and I wouldn't be shocked if we ever do make our way to Fallout 5 if we don't see at least some of these make a return, but at least for the time being, the reason that Megasloths are in Fallout 76 and not in Fallout 4 is they simply couldn't make the cut. But then for those of you just recently getting into Fallout 76, there's also some pretty interesting lore around Vault 51 and also kind of the Battle Royale mode, aka what's actually going on here. I imagine a lot of people, especially those typically just playing adventure mode have missed this because a lot of it's actually locked behind leveling up in nuclear winter. But Bethesda actually has some pretty valid lore explanations for one, how the overseer is found, or kind of, but also how the battle royale is actually occurring. It's pretty well known that at its core, the nuclear winter mode is basically just Zax in Vault 51 trying to find the best Vault 51 candidate to become overseer but it actually goes a little bit further than that. Bethesda went on to actually also explain why there's a nuclear firestorm. It seems like that as a byproduct of the constant nuking by people from Vault 76, pretty much what we've been doing in game for the past few months, has led to a pyroclastic storm as it's described in game. So basically the constant nuking and taking down of the Scorch Beast Queens, or rather attempts at taking down and finishing off the Scorch Beast Queens has made the environment so unstable that in the future, Appalachia will actually develop this pyroclastic storm as we see it in Nuclear Winter. That in and of itself seems to be kind of problemsome. I wonder if there's going to be lore explanations as to how that dissipates or how people survive it. But also with that in mind, it does mean that Nuclear Winter as you play it is actually in a future version of Appalachia. And based on terminal entries you can find, it seems like the mode actually takes place six years in the future, in 2108, which actually means a couple of things. First and foremost, that it is the future, but also that Wastelanders, the next DLC, will seemingly be even further in the future, more than six years ahead, because it wouldn't really make sense for it to take place during or before this pyroclastic storm. But there also is a decently sized plot hole with this whole thing. The same terminal entry that does give us the most most recent date is in 2108, basically saying how a large crate is lost, actually distributed out into Appalachia. Seemingly, that was the crate that did contain the Vault 51 Overseer. 
this is where you could find those mysterious hollow tapes as well as the overseer himself but considering adventure mode takes place in 2102 and this terminal entry where the crate is lost is from 2108 unless this overseer is a time travel how is he back in 2102 the lore around the overseer escaping the vault doesn't line up with the overseer we actually find perhaps this is just two separate overseers that we don't have the full context on but either way yeah there is definitely some time changes going on with the future of fallout 76 and already some of them are introduced but outside of that we also do have the origin of the Myra region to me at least this region without a doubt stands out as being kind of distinctive from the rest it's much swampier in nature you can find a plethora of far harbor creatures that seemingly don't have much of a place in this area and in general it just has the most distinctive feel i would say out of the six regions well right on the edge of the mire is actually vault 94 and if you're not familiar with this vault basically the experiment going on with it was a church congregation was inducted into it but they were actually given no weapons and just overall a little bit too ignorance is bliss when it comes to the kind of bad stuff going on in the outside world this will be explored further in a future dlc but also it seems like this was one of the areas supplied with a gek otherwise known as a garden of eden creation kit as a terminal in Harper's Ferry located in the mire and just outside of Vault 94 explains how there may have been some large explosion here you first can read about someone named Miranda she describes how recently at Harper's Ferry following the bombs dropping they just had their first ray of hope an ambassador from Vault 94 arrived she had real food she said the vault had enough supplies to establish a farm that could feed us all but then there was some regret she describes how she sent a group to go check out this story and verify it and then describes how it wasn't long before before we heard the explosion and the earth shook. Vault 94 and all its promise was destroyed and now a strange cloud emanates from the entrance. Wafing down into the surrounding forest, what have we done? But what is far more interesting is actually a follow-up terminal entry from a totally separate person that talks to Miranda and this second terminal entry seems to take place later in time chronologically. It's described how a Vault 94 ambassador actually came up to Harper's Ferry and basically describes a Gek in action and somehow messing it all up and calling causing a massive explosion. Then they talk about how there was a second large explosion following the bombs dropping. So it seems like this would have happened shortly thereafter the bombs dropping initially. But then the part where it gets particularly interesting, it explains the second large explosion we felt after the bombs dropped and how this mysterious fog came rolling out which stirred up all this change. I can't even begin to scientifically theorize the effect it would have on an environment when improperly utilized. As we go to the mire, it seems like this fog has largely dissipated, but I would bet this fog is actually a lore explanation for the Far Harbor creatures in Fallout 76. The fog is always mysterious from Far Harbor. We don't necessarily know its origins, we don't necessarily know what kind of impact it is having directly, and I think somehow this fog was recreated in Appalachia, specifically the Meyer region, leading to some of the natural creatures to spawn there to become mutated similar to how they were mutated in Far Harbor. Also, if the people of Vault 94 did set off a Gek, it probably means the entire vault was at least partially cleared out. We know that's coming in a DLC later this summer, so I'm sure there'll be a lot more information then. But last but not least, one of the last interesting pieces of lore that I found and wanted to point out was actually about the Overseer. In Fallout 76, your initial quests are following in the footsteps of the Overseer. Despite that, not many people follow the footsteps all the way through. Even though this is meant to be part of the main quest, after a while it actually turns into side or secondary quests that you can pass up or just miss altogether, but one hall tape actually gives you a lot of backstory and context around the Overseer that details just how large of a sacrifice she actually made. So this does have some minor spoilers, it's part of the Personal Matters quest and specifically the Overseer's Journal Entry 5 if you want to check it out for yourself, but otherwise, during the Personal Matters quest, you take a little kind of sidestep with the Overseer as she diverts off the path that Vault Tech set her on and just starts visiting some of the locations she grew up around, checking out to see what happened to her family and friends. As you make your way to Welch, you do find out about Evan. Vault 76 was built to take the best and the brightest. But that wasn't what all the vaults were for. The Societal Preservation Program. I wasn't supposed to know about it. But when I found out, Evan wanted me to tell the press. But I didn't. Yes. Experimenting on vault residents was ethically wrong, but the goal of finding the most suitable people to repopulate, to understand humanity pushed to the extremes, what if that was the only way for us to survive? We can't save everyone. That's what they always told us. And I thought 
I still think they were right. vault -Tec found out that I knew. I thought I was going to be fired or arrested, but instead they confided in me. Vault 76 was going to be a control vault. No experiment. I was so relieved, but they told me I was going to be assigned to Vault 101 in Washington, D.C. I had to leave West Virginia. My people behind. I couldn't let them do that. No matter what it took. I'm so sorry, Evan. I wish I could say I would have made another choice. That I would have picked dying in this house together when the bombs fell. I never stopped thinking about you. And I'm not giving up until I find out what happened. So in other words, the Vault 76 overseer knew about some of the messed up experimentation that was going on, but felt, at least in her eyes, the ends justified the means and didn't go public for that reason. Even further, something else pretty interesting, it was actually also described in this holotape how originally she was meant to be assigned to Vault 101 in Washington, D.C. Naturally, she persuades vault Tech otherwise ends up in Vault 76, but all the while actually kind of knowing that her husband or boyfriend Evan would be stuck outside of the vault, not actually a allowed to enter as Vault 76 was built for just the best and the brightest. But yeah, otherwise, those are six pieces of lore that I found interesting through playing Fallout 76 that I thought you would also find pretty interesting. There's a lot of lore in this game that I think it's overlooked or passed up, and maybe it's due to the way it's told, but at the same time, hopefully videos like this make it more digestible and even maybe even more interesting. As always, again, I thank you all for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. Hopefully you found it informative or just enjoyable. But with that, I hope to see you guys all next time. Later.